I'm Clint, and welcome to Swatches live stream number 66. Uh, this is an art review live stream where I'll be taking a look at the art submissions from you, the viewers who have purchased an e-ticket to have your images reviewed. And currently, we are on the Machine and Giant Art Challenge. So the uh, submitters have the choice of the two different subjects that they can send in. We'll walk through that and talk about that for just a moment. But as this is a live stream, I just want to double check that my settings look good. I have 0.03 drop frames. I think that's okay. Uh, I'm not losing any more from there. And it looks like my audio is working this time. <laughs> Last time, for some reason, my mic was not coming through. So I will get that out of the way. Uh, we already have a load of people in here. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate you joining me, and I'm glad that you're part of the community. I'm glad that you find these uh, episodes very helpful. And I got to say, I'm excited to get into this. Uh, of course, we took off last week because I was out of town. But I'm looking forward to getting back into it and looking at these images. I will try to fit in as many questions as I reasonably can throughout the course of this. So if you want to toss me a question or a comment, uh, you can type swatches in your comment if you're joining live, and it will flag it for me, and I'll try to enter it during the course. Uh, so we already got quite a few people in here. Thomas, Anna, Gato, Hobbit, Arlie, Anna, Robert, uh, Esri, Federico, good to see everybody. Esri says, uh, glad to see you again. Almost forgot the time you started today. Yeah, I got a little behind. I don't know. I always underestimate how long it takes to break down the computer and, and move and set it back up and everything. A uh, little information on that, actually. Uh, I've got to move again. And, of course, for anybody that's been around here for a while, they'll know that that's not a new thing. I, I tend to move fairly often. But uh, my landlord wants to work on the house that I'm currently in. It's not completely finished. And so I need to go find somewhere else. And this might actually be a really good thing for the channel. Uh, if I can find a house, which I might have found, I've got to talk to the guy tomorrow, but if I can find a house uh, here in town that has higher speed internet, then I can, uh, I can stream from home. And I won't have to break down the computer and, and drive the town and set it back up every time I want to stream. And if that's the case, then I can uh, pick up Twitch streaming again because I would love to be able to do live painting with you guys and it would also give me an opportunity to offer consultations at more hours and more days. I could even think about doing uh, courses or classes online where it'd be on a more uh, set schedule. So it could be a really good thing, inconvenient, but ultimately it could be a really good thing for the channel. So I have uh, high hopes that this a uh, certain location I'm looking at might work out, but I will let you guys know. Uh, that's also kind of a segue to saying, uh, depending when I find something and when I'm moving, uh, the schedule with the live streaming might be thrown off. I might have to delay or shift to another day or something like that. I will try to let you guys know as soon as I know, and we'll go from there. <laughs> Okay, uh, so the outline for this particular challenge that the uh, artists are trying to fill is either doing a machine, which is depict a medieval mecca over a blank background. It should be an autonomous machine, has no driver, and be powered by steam, coal, or some magical means. Uh, the machine is for warring or protection with some sort of visible weaponry. Uh, the ideas that I based that on were primarily images from the game uh, Dark Age. You can see the images here. These are not mine. These are a variety of different uh, inspiration images I collected. On the other hand, we have the giant. Uh, I wanted to have a portrait challenge, but if it was a straightforward portrait, uh, we would likely get into the position where people would just be copying photos. And I didn't really want that. I wanted to be able to push you guys to get the human face and the human head and push it in a different direction and show some creativity with it, which is why I decided some sort of giant character that has a bit misshapen features. And that was the second option down here. 
Uh, neither one of these are really full illustrations. They're more just like high uh, concept art pieces. So creating a lot of mood, uh, dynamic lighting, that sort of thing is less important than just having a good readable images. Uh, and that's what we have here as well on these images. Uh, you don't see fancy lighting going on. I guess this guy more than anything, but even he has a pretty straightforward lighting situation. You can readily see all the uh, subject matter there. That's what I wanted to focus on. Okay, so I will probably just leave those up in case we need a reference back to that. And let's go in here. Oh, uh, I don't know if I'm saying the name right. Joven? I don't know if that's a, a J or an H. Hoven. Anyway, Joven, uh, I'm using your image on the thumbnail for this video. Uh, if you have any problem with that, let me know. I'll swap it out. Uh, but that's, uh, it worked well in the thumbnail, so I grabbed it. Okay, uh, we're going to just go alphabetically here. I've already opened them up and just made some marks, uh, outline a couple of things that I want to talk about on each of them. Uh, I haven't done any paint overs to these, but... Okay, let's start by... Uh, this is uh, Anna Remtke, and she says, I'm really enjoying this challenge. It is great for form studies. It really is. Uh, that's one of the good things about this one and something that we'll be talking about through various of these images. It is great for form studies and leaving the usual portrait boundaries when it becomes... Uh, well, let me move that out of the way for a second. When it, become, when it comes to beauty and flawlessness. Uh, I hadn't thought about in that terms, Anna, but that's really a good point because in a lot of the images that we do, we're called upon to do really, really attractive people that are pretty much flawless. And this kind of goes against that where he should look brutish and maybe slightly orcish or a little animalistic. And it's okay if he's a bit lopsided and I, I think that's a really good thing to practice, and it's a good point to uh, notice. I've not yet decided what lighting and what coloring to go for, so I'd like, love to hear your opinion about this. Uh, thank you, as always. Uh, okay, so here, I'm going to say your lighting is pretty good uh, as you've got it. I don't want to get real fancy with it. Uh, let's kind of keep with what you have, which is a decent... Uh, fill light, soft light going on him on this side, and maybe just add a bit of a side light coming in over the side. So kind of like the light that you have right along there, and then the light that you see sort of coming up over that side of that guy, and just add another light source sort of running across right here. And I'd say you're pretty good there. Uh, and th that's about all you need for an image like this. Um, take a look at the comments. Uh, guys, uh, not sponsored, but kombucha, live kombucha. Man, this stuff is good. If you haven't picked this stuff up, this is the guava mango. That's what I'm drinking in case anybody's curious. And it is really tasty. And of course, it has uh, live probiotics in it, which are really good for you and your uh, gut health, which I know is very important for me. So I always try to pay attention to that. Okay, so let's talk a bit about anatomy. Uh, first up, I'm gonna say you're in a good place. I think as far as concepts go, this is pretty much doing everything that a concept needs to do at this stage. Uh, it's giving me a very clear idea of who this character is, kind of what his physicality is, a bit about what his behavior is, uh, I guess his attitude. And what we wanna go to do from here is to just breathe in a bit more uh, believable anatomy and to help sell uh, the realism of this character and there's a couple of different points that we want to look at so let's start with in no particular order uh, the head and the skull area now we can have a lot of different shapes of skulls uh, these guys show some adjusted shapes for skulls but one thing that you're going to have fairly consistent is that the skull is going to be centered on the head 
uh, back there. And here it kind of looks like there's a big dip in the skull. It's like it dips down in the middle and comes back. Where it's okay if we have the brow shape coming up here, the big kind of almost caveman brow. But then let's make sure that there is another shape right here that's not so far back because it ends up looking like it's more part of this brow shape than part of the cranium itself. So let's make sure that, that we've got that form of that round coming back here. Uh, Anna says, uh, you did a creation for August in September as patron of $40 tour. When will you send out the critique videos approximately? Uh, you did a creation. When will I send out for the newest uh, set for September? Then I have set aside some time on Tuesday. I've already done paint overs uh, and marked down points that I want to cover on two of them that were sent in. Uh, I'm not sure how many I'll get done. I'll do as many as I can basically on Tuesday. And I should be sending out messages probably tomorrow that has the links to the video library so everyone can go out and watch the feedback videos if that's what you're talking about. Okay, so uh, that would be there. Uh, another thing would be to look at the shapes of right here between the brow. And right now we've got this kind of odd set where we have sort of cylindrical shapes. I'm gonna pick something else that's a different color than all those. We have these sort of cylindrical uh, shapes here, and then like a different set of the same thing right below it. Uh, and that, that's not feeling quite right and natural. Uh, we can twist it, but we need to base it on the normal shapes. So like if we look at this guy here, we can see we have like this big cylindrical shape, and then these sort of drop below it. And then of course the nose breaks it up in the middle. And we're getting some of those shapes off. So let's think about, we're gonna have a break here of where that brow bends. And then we also need that same curve on the other side where that brow can move. And where it's naturally going to have a crease here and here. Now, if he has a really wide nose like this fella, it's gonna be way out on those sides. But either way, we need to have a break on that side. And we're gonna have that, uh, that section kind of like this, and then it's going to come out from there. And then that brings us into looking at the bridge in the nose. Uh, we've really lost the shape of any kind of uh, nasal bridge, and that should be something that's fairly set because that's the actual bony part. Now we can shape this different ways. It can be curving down, it can curving up. Uh, personally, I think the up curve is probably more appropriate for your particular design. So, because he's a, a real squash sort of brutish guy. And if we were to uh, curve that up here, then I think that would make more sense and we wouldn't have these here. We might just have some uh, smaller uh, little uh, creases in that area. And then we could even have some creases at the top of the, the nose bit here. But thinking about it in planes could be helpful. So we think about, okay, we have kind of an arched shape there, and then it has a side coming down here. Uh, then that's where it runs into this sort of sphere shape. Uh, then it comes down here. And we've got another shape here that could even be seen as a sphere. Uh, then that's going to have to have a joint here. Uh, then these are kind of like curved cylinder shapes. And that's going to help bring a bit more form and the believability to those different planes of the face. So uh, we're going to look at that. Uh, next up, let's pay attention to how the, uh, how the forms are working here. So you got the big brow there, and you notice that it kind of makes this sort of pattern of those dipped curves underneath. And I would like to see that executed more here. 
because it's not going to get real bulgy right here. I mean, this can curve down, but it's going to be doing kind of that sort of thing, right? So instead of it going, it's almost going the opposite way here, kind of like that. We're probably going to see it going more like this. Uh, again, take a look at your references and, and watch how those shapes work there. Uh, and the further that that brow comes down, the more that it's going to just overlap the eye. Oh, yeah. uh, anything else? Yeah, moving on. Uh, for as thick as you seem to be making him, I'm thinking we might get more of a big jowl underneath the neck and possibly other smaller ones underneath that. Instead of a lot of these kind of small wrinkles, we're likely going to get at least one larger sort of jowl hanging down. And then we're going to lead into a bit of these smaller ones that you have there. He also has his head tilted back a little bit. So you're likely not going to have a lot, a lot of folds. Um, you'll probably have some folds more on this side because he's cranking over to that side. So this side will have more folds here, but this side essentially is stretching out. So it won't have as many folds in that area there. Okay. Yeah, uh, just watching the shape here, uh, we're running into some odd ways of breaking this up. Uh, generally, you're going to have you know, one, one major shape there for the chin. But I guess you're kind of going with the, the cleft chin thing. But there's a particular way that you need to shave that and, and to establish that rounded form of the cleft, which is fine. I mean, do the cleft if that's what you're going for. But otherwise, it looks like maybe his, you, you just weren't real sure about the shape of where the chin is. So I'd be watching that. Um, oh, yeah, we got some hair coming down on this side, which I think is a good call. Uh, and this uh, goes to a couple of different people who were doing hair or asking about hair on their character. Uh, I think the hair is a good idea because you'll find if you do a character like this and you don't give them hair, it really starts to border on being alien. But some reason, if you start giving them more hair, they start feeling more humanoid and less alien-like. Uh, but here we just have hair on this side, and I don't see any hair on that side. So we do want to make sure that we're seeing a bit along that other side there. Uh, anything else? Oh yeah, on this side, uh, he doesn't look like he's just super, super fat. Because here in the face, he's not really got a lot of fat. I mean, he's, he's squashed, but there is, like, if we look at that, that's, that's fairly thin along the cheeks. And if he was really fat, that would be, that would be getting, you know, hefty along the cheeks, a bit saggy there, and, and filling out the cheeks there and, and, and the jowls and the, uh, the jawline. Uh, so I don't know that he would really have that much on this side. Uh, he's likely to have something a bit more like what you see on these fellows, which is just a really, really stocky neck, uh, then leading into the trapezius, with maybe just some small little general wrinkles along that area, uh, more like what you have down there. Okay, well, that's a run-through of your piece. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with it. I, I think pushing with also the... The kind of the ochre skin tone is working well for you. Uh, so uh, hopefully you find that helpful. And of course, you've got uh, two more weeks in order to work up for the final. Which makes me think, let's see, six. Yeah, I think I'll still be available. I'm going out to uh, an event at the end of the month, but I don't think I'll be gone by then. So. All right, next up, Anna Maria. Let me take a look at chat. Um, okay. Uh, Anna Maria uh, says, uh, I haven't got very 
far, even though I had three weeks. But I like to aim for a gritty and rough skin, like in the paintings, and also try out some war paints on him. Uh, that's, that's great. I like that idea. Uh, we got a guy here with some war paints. We'll zoom up and take a look at him. I also wonder if he's too much uh, like an orc or if his features are too normal. Uh, thanks again. So let's pull up and take a look at some of the inspiration that she was looking at. Uh, really nice lineup of reference images, and I do like seeing you guys go out and find some that really help push the image in the direction that you want to go. Uh, of course, these were the references that I had initially prompted you guys with to help get you uh, on the right page. Uh, I think you've all pretty much stuck with that. So, cool stuff there. Uh, we've got the war paint here. That's good. Uh, I also think you're making the right call with you paint it normal first, and then you go back and add the paint on top once you're happy with everything else. But trying to map the paint as you're changing the shape of the head just gets really complicated and you end up wasting a bunch of time. Uh, I'm familiar with this guy's work. I, I don't know how you say his name, but I love his work. Uh, really, really good lighting. And about a little bit about your question of being orcish. And he's, if you had just tossed it to me, I would say, oh, that's probably an orc. That would be my initial thought. And that comes from a couple of different things. Uh, I think the first thing is that he is green, and we commonly associate green with orcs. And like this guy over here, uh, he feels more giant because he's not green. Even though all the features and the designs are the same, he's more of a common human skin color. So that would feel one, uh, more, more human-like or giant-like. Other changes you might make. Of course, uh, the big tusk or a big orc call. So I'm going to say either change the green to being more normal flesh tone or get rid of the tusk. Or even if you just gave him more human ears instead of the pointy sort of orc ears, uh, that would be it. So there's three options there you could think about playing around with. But if you want to finish this one up, if you, if you really have uh, kind of your heart set on this, I'm not going to give you a hard time about it. My whole thing is I just want you guys to work on a portrait to kind of push yourself. And, uh, and if you're happy with this, I'm happy with it. So we can move forwards with it. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, green and ears. Uh, and in no particular order on these other ones. Uh, color variation is something going forwards that I really think that you can make use of. Uh, perhaps you just weren't at the stage where you're really working with that very much. Wei Feng is the artist. Oh, okay, yep, I recognize the name now that you say it. I think I follow him out on ArtStation. And so over here, uh, let's take a look at some of the things that they're doing with these guys. Uh, like even this guy over here, you can see that very uh, reddish sort of violet tones there around the nose, around this area. Uh, then you have the very cool tones around the stubble, uh, on the lower part. And the upper part generally shifts into a slightly more yellow skin tone. And you also have warmer tones right around the eyes with the capillaries very close around the eyelids. And all of those together give a, a richer, more uh, believable skin tone. Even up on this guy, he's under a fairly flat light, but there's a lot of skin tone here too. You've got all of the pink tones here, a deeper violet tones around the lips. Uh, you have a bit more of the ochre color here, and of course moving up into the, the violets up there. The ears are also pink, very much like the nose. And I, it just gives more color, believability to these guys. So on yours, um, we could think about doing a very similar thing. You could just set up like an overlay layer and grab a little brush. Let's uh, turn that off for a second. Also, let's adjust the values here. We are sticking fairly, eh, not, not real committed to the values on this one. Uh, I'm gonna use love, uh, curves. So I'm gonna drop down the lights a little bit, move in the blacks a bit.
Okay. So on curves, uh, we adjusted it, get some darks back some, and then we can add some skin tone. Let's see if we get a bit more. Oh yeah, I don't really need that 100%. Let's set that down a bit. bit more red perhaps along this area and that's if you want to stick to normal skin tones uh, you could shift it into being like it becomes more purple or green or or something like that uh, but I'm gonna just stick with the usual ones you get maybe a little more violet up in here we're also going to get more violet around the ears And we get a bit more of the yellow green up at top. And then we get some of the cooler color. I, I'm exaggerating this so this can uh, show up better on the screen. And then even on the uh, teeth, we can add probably a bit of color there and get those more yellowed. And you'll see that they're usually a bit more yellowed at the bottom, but then they transition to being kind of a blue-greenish at the top where they get uh, thinner. might even get a little bit red right there on the bottom where they're near the gums. Uh, so that would just help bring a bit more interest to the overall piece uh, that way. Uh, what else? Uh, the hair here, and a couple of you have done it this way, and it's fine if you're just blocking it in this way, uh, but once you come back to do some revision on it, we really want to think about the fact that these guys are likely not real big on self-care and that their hair is not combed. So let's make sure that when you come back in and do some work on this, that we're messing up this hair so it's a bit more wildly and it kind of you know goes off in different little groups. And it's obviously more unkept. Uh, some of it is going to just be kind of you know sticking off in different directions. It's not going to just be having hanging straight down. Uh, some of it on this side, you can probably see maybe catching some of that light over there. And I'm going to suggest you go and make sure that you're looking at some photos. I mean, just go to Pinterest and look at you know, beard photos. And you can even use like a squiggly brush if you wanted to, just kind of mess it up to start with. So something more on that line, make him feel a little bit more rough. Uh, we want to watch a little bit of shapes uh, here. I, I like the lighting. It's a straightforward lighting. Uh, we are going to be getting a bit more light. Uh, yeah, and I like your 3D model there that you, you're basing this on and uh, the lighting cues you're getting from that. I don't want that brush. Let me catch a little light there. I think we really need to start telling that form a bit more. And we might want to add some color to the eye, just having the, the basic kind of white, um, not as interesting. Um, you know, if we sparked it up with some green, if we gave it, you know, orange, whatever color that you like, but a little color would be more helpful. Uh, what else was I thinking about? Oh, like on the scar, uh, we have like some, some serious scarring going on with 
the face up in the sketch, uh, but not as noticeable uh, down here on the main image. So I'd like to see that added back in. And what you can do is add, uh, it's been a little bit since I've done scars. You know, somebody to look at, uh, I remember seeing the concept art, I can't remember the character's name, the white orc from the movie The Hobbit. Um, it was like Asgog or something like that. I'll look at the concept art for the white orc from the film The Hobbit, and there's some really good images, and he's got all of these scars on him. And I remember whoever did that did a really good job and it's worth looking at. Uh, if I can remember uh, doing like a, let's kind of do this sort of thing. Let's say there's kind of like three of them. Uh, then you want to come in here and it's like you put in a dark kind of warmish tone. Uh, then you come in and put in a lighter tone on top of that. And because uh, scars often get lighter than the skin around them. So we can put that in. We kind of put in basically the little shadow. But scars also pull. So you're going to get kind of shapes where the scar sort of does this sort of thing. And, and the surrounding area tries to pull in to cover that little spot where the uh, the skin got damaged uh, and some of it, it almost you know heals up but then it's trying to pinch together to heal that uh, and from here the uh, the scarred skin gets to be more uh, glossy, the normal skin. So we could even have like little bits of uh, almost like little highlights, little glossy spots down on the opposite side of the light source. Uh, then on this side, the skin is pulling up to try to catch it. So it might actually pick up a little light along that side of it. But that, that's just a real brief uh, you know, look at kind of doing scars. And that goes to a couple of you, not just uh, for Anna Maria, but uh, some of you were trying to do um, different damages and, and that sort of thing. And we haven't really talked about it. So uh, a quick look at doing that effect. And I think it would be really fitting for a guy like this. Just make sure that when you're thinking about it, uh, work through how that scar is actually working on the face. Because, of course, uh, you can think about like, if you were made a straight line across the face, where is it catching? In this case, it's probably gonna be catching, uh, let's grab like a green. Uh, it's gonna be catching like here and here because those are the high points, and this is sort of a low point, so probably not there and likely not through that area because again, it dips back, but then it would, if it's continuing a straight line, it's going to gouge through here and that's probably going to be it. So boom, boom, boom. Uh, you know, is it a multi-clawed thing? Because maybe you have a bit of another scar right there and then maybe they coalesce, you know, kind of down here. So think about how it works. Don't just uh, put it in there willy nilly, give it a little thought. But I'm going to wrap it up there, uh, Anna Maria really good position uh, that you're in. No no big changes to make, like big anatomy things off or anything. I, I think it's simply just moving forward, uh, making sure that it has the right balance of giant ogre as to the direction that you're wanting. Uh, make sure it has some good skin tones in there and continue just to, to clean up the different shapes, clean up the shading, clean up what the skin tones are and whatever damages and stuff that you like. So we will close that. Okay, any comments? Uh, apologize for interrupting your analysis, but I'm curious, how does one take part in these challenges? Sid, excellent question. Uh, in case somebody has not answered it, I'll go ahead and answer it on stream. Uh, these challenges are available if you pick up an e-ticket. So once a month, we kick off one of these challenges, 
and the next challenge will start in two weeks, uh, which will conclude this particular challenge and we'll start a new one. So I reckon uh, two weeks, uh, what, 14 on the 20th, so probably on the 21st, that Saturday, I will put up the e-tickets for sale. Uh, they are $20. Uh, they will be available on the Swatches site, which is swatchesart.com. It is the Gumroad store. Uh, there is a limit of 12 tickets, and half of them go up at about 1 p.m. or so, Central Standard Time. And the other half goes up for sale about 12 hours later, right before I go to bed, uh, so people on the other side of the world can have an opportunity to uh, pick those up at a more convenient time. And then that will have instructions about where to submit it and how to get it to me. Uh, then I will review it as part of the live streams. So if you have more clarifications that you need, you can probably ask chat. Uh, most of the people here are very willing to help you out and fill in on the details, but hopefully that answers your primary question. Aurelie is up next. Well, let's take a look at her. She's the only one doing a female giant, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, I think, I think the rest of these were male. So, uh, Arlie, good to see uh, a female giant going on here. Cool stuff. Uh, you said, uh, once again, I didn't have much time to work on it. I think I'm missing the brutish part. I'll try to improve on that. How do you render skin texture? I'd like to think that I render it pretty well, but, you know, I'm not completely successful at it. I'm still learning. I'm being facetious. Um, uh, skin is, part of it is what we talked about which is making sure that you have a decent amount of skin variation, skin tone variation with the color. The other thing is really paying attention to the glossiness or matteness of the skin. And that skin is primarily uh, what you'd call luster. It's not matte, it's not dull, but it's also not glossy. So it's right in the middle, what, what I call luster. And it is something that has, uh, I was gonna say it. This uh, tone variation uh, has luster. Uh, there was something I was gonna say, but I can't think of it. I'll come back to it. Uh, so on yours, let's kind of talk about some of the forms and the brutus shapes uh, that we can work on. Uh, there's several things right now that make her feel not real brutish. And one of those is the hair looks like it's been styled in a salon. And that her hair is super, like, super uh, straight uh, and, 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 you know, styled. So that doesn't give a real British appearance. Um, think about making the hair feel more more tribal, less less kept. Uh, it can still kind of have a curve to it. It can be like she turned her head and it's kind of hanging behind her, but it's not going to be this perfect curve. Uh, the hair is going to be a little more clumpy. Uh, it's going to have uh, maybe some more variations, some kinks in it. Uh, there's going to be some, some little strands sticking out where she hasn't combed it. Uh, so yeah, that, that's going to help with it. Uh, I think having some of the little braids there is fine. It shows a little culture or personality to it, but let's just not get too perfect with it. Uh, another thing is uh, we need to play up some of the more brutish shapes. Uh, part of that comes in from the brow is often seen as being a brutish shape. Uh, Bayard Wu has uh, excellent direction on his orc character, Bayard Wu. And you can see the heavy brow, and that's also something that we see on a lot of these. Big, heavy brow all through these. Uh, even though it's not as big here, the jaw is certainly way bigger, um, but distinctive shape with little eyes on that guy. Same thing here, it's really exaggerated. Big, wide nose. Uh, here she, uh, she has a very thin brow, uh, and very kind of stylized. So let's see about giving her a little bit more of the caveman brow where the, uh, let's get a different brush, a little, little bigger. 
and the very you have a very thin eyebrow there so we can kind of drop this down and drop the uh, brow over the the face uh, the eyes more so we have kind of more of that shape So it's kind of encroaching over the eye. Uh, same thing here. That this brow could be heavier. And instead of just kind of one line, let's see if we can break it up into a couple of different little shapes, give it a bit more personality. I might throw in a little of that uh, hair tone there. This is also somewhere where we're going to be getting a lot of folds with that expression. Now the next thing we're going to do, I guess somebody's weed eating outside. Hopefully you don't pick that up too much. Uh, then the next thing we want to do is look at the volume of the eye, and that's something that we're really losing. We're just getting the shape of an eye, but it's very two-dimensional. And we really want to look at getting the volume of that sphere. Because here, what I want to do is pay attention to, okay, we have the eye, the sphere of the eyeball itself, and then the eye is open. Uh, then we're going to the thickness of the eyelid around it. Uh, then that eye thickness has to go around it in a different, another layer. Uh, then that's going to run into that other shape. So over here, we need to see a bit more of that, where we have the eye ball. But then this, okay, slanted eyes, that's fine. Our eyes doing that. But then we're going to have some thickness to that. Uh, then we're going to have that shape running into the other shapes. And then this is going to have to fold across it up here. Uh, then those two have to meet because that eyebrow is coming down here. So they're going to be a conflict between those two volumes. And we're going to have that here. Might have a bit of a warm tone there when you can see the thickness of that. Probably going to have some shadow there. We're also going to have a little shadow here. Might have a shadow underneath this. Here. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that under light just to simplify it for a second. this volume and then we're going to run it into this volume usually I have a little light right there it's going to go around that so we want to bring in some of those shapes uh, you can see that on Bayard's image as well whoa that was way Uh, okay, anything else we're going to be looking at? Oh, yeah, uh, the shape of the nose, uh, that's something else we want to develop. Uh, we probably want to give her, she has like a very pointed kind of aggressive features. Uh, so we might give her a nose that has a bit more of that going on. It can be here, and then it comes out this way, or we could arch the nose you know, top down, so it has kind of this curve to the overall, you know, face. In which case, on some of these uh, characters, you, you really exaggerate that nose form to the point where that nose is actually uh, overshadowing the, uh, the other eye. Uh, overlapping, sorry.
And same thing with the mouth. Like the mouth, uh, you've got just uh, big lips here. We can probably work in some of the other shapes, like the philtrum there. And then we want to look at giving her probably a bit more of a scowl. Get her a little less uh, normal, a bit more brutish. We can drop scowl there. And play up this shape underneath the mouth. You can see that on this one. That's kind of a brutish shape there. And it's also going to play into this one. Now you probably don't want to uh, really do a lot with that. Uh, making that dark, but what you can do is just kind of highlight up that form as it changes there. Uh, anything else I was looking at? Oh yeah, uh, you. Sh I'm getting the appearance of like she should be really muscular and built, uh, but she seems to be having her head turned at such an angle. Like she's she's not that far from being full face to us, but her her face and her body are literally at like 90 degree angles, and it just seems like too much of a head turn. Uh, we probably want to put her shoulder more like here. And she's almost looking just along her body. I cannot, I don't know if anybody can really turn their head at a complete 90. Uh, we're likely going to have that and then have her trapezius more like this. And then going to have the neck here. But in actuality, like her neck seems really far back. That seems like a long way back to have her neck connect. So we're likely going to have that here and then maybe move up the back side of it a little bit. More like that. Okay, that'll do it for this one. Our early uh, good direction. And thanks for joining the challenge. Jackie Kerr is up next. Uh, it says, hi Clint, I was thinking of using the value in color studies three for color and lighting. Does that seem okay? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, you're saying you're going to use both of these? Value and color study three of both of them? Uh, I want to say you, probably not because this is really more complex uh, than what you need to do. It's already more complex than a normal lighting. So... Uh, let's just do a normal kind of down lighting. Uh, if you want to use, you know, a different skin tone, that's fine. But let's not focus on trying to make it complicated colors, complicated lighting. This is really just working on the design of the character. Heck, if you want to just do this in black and white, that's fine too. Um, no reason to overload it. This is more of a design challenge than it is uh, a really good rendering scene. Uh, do you think he needs some hair or more markings or tattoo things? I think hair would be a good idea, even if he wasn't full-headed. Like, even this guy over here has a little tuft of hair at the top. Again, keeps him looking too alien, because for whatever reason, we assume aliens wouldn't have hair. Which is kind of remarkable, because if you watch a lot of sci-fi movies, there are not that many aliens that have hair. Of course, we have, you know, Chewbacca and the Wookiees, but... Uh, in a lot of the Star Trek and a lot of the other Star Wars characters, no hair. Yep. Um, so uh, let's talk about what we need to do here. Uh, the biggest thing here is we're, we're getting probably too far away from paying attention to the basic forms. So I'm going to suggest forget about the colors. Uh, and let's go back to just making sure that we're building good forms. I feel like you're, uh, you're looking at these, you're taking some ideas, and you're getting a good idea with it, but you're letting yourself run away with the shapes and not thinking about the volumes of what's going on. And I would rather you get the volumes right, because in the end, that's going to be far more useful uh, for your skills. And that means... 
you know, go back to drawing. It's like, okay, I'm starting with a sphere. All right, cool. And then the face is going to be coming down. The center of the face is going to be kind of like this. And if I have the side of the head, it's going to be kind of like that. And it's going to come down here. It's, and it's going to be like very chin forward. Okay. And then I'm going to have the eye level sort of here. And the nose will be here. And it does this sort of thing. Uh, which makes me think that it sort of has this, uh, a very big muzzle shape along here. So I might just kind of drop that in as a, as a sphere. I'll just clean that up a little bit. Or what they also call the, the mouth barrel what curves there. And here I'm building it off of a form to begin with. So I know that everything lines up. And that tells me that the ear, see the ear is going to line up halfway back on the head. Here the ear is like literally on the back of the head. So that already tells me something really interesting there. And that here we can have the ear and then we need the back of the head going back behind the ear. Uh, then that's going to be running down kind of you know behind the ear into the neck and he's got like a big you know, traps going on or whatever uh, then we have the nose the nose i think has probably the best um rendered volume of the group of uh features and here we have you know the big almost diamond shaped nose shape there and we want to have, I guess we're going with kind of a scowly expression, angry expression there. And the eye is likely going to just be barely tucked up underneath that. And he's going to have some volume around his eye. And again, kind of the same shapes. We're going to have, boom, that coming down. And then this bit is probably going to be curving back up there, and then we have the little pinch lines here. And then the mouth, we're going with sort of that thing mixed in with this guy, it looks like. So if we look at this guy and look at this uh, mouth shape, this whole image was stretched, but we can still get the idea like, it kind of curves down on top and it does this sort of thing. Uh, so we need to map that to our mouth barrel and that means it's going to be kind of going like this. Uh, having just the two teeth uh, and, and we don't really see the gums that it sticks to, uh, make sure that we're you know looking at this sort of thing. Take some pictures of uh, somebody in you know with your camera. Uh, with your phone, whatever you've got to take pictures with. And, and and look how the mouth and the teeth work inside of the mouth. Uh, and, and that's going to really help a lot believe, uh, selling the believability. Now something else you want to see here is that from this side the mouth goes like that, but from the other side it does the same thing. And that skin is going to try to stay as tight as it can. It's, you know, going to be sticking to the mouth and trying to stretch. So on this side it's going to be doing that, but on that side we actually have to have it kind of doing the opposite of what you might think it would be. It's not going to be curving outward as much, so we're going to be doing that. I think that's going to have uh, expression is really going to bring out these lines. So we're likely going to have this fold is going to be wanting to connect up with that guy. Um, that mouth barrel shape here and that chin nice and big like big chin on this fella so we might even stick that chin out a bit more there uh, we can accentuate brow shape on that and then he's got all the foldy bits there and yeah give him some hair he doesn't have to have a lot of hair uh, it's more like this fellow here, something like that would probably work really well for your idea. Um, and just some little loose kind of hair hanging back there. You might just show a little couple of strands, a little stubble, you know, sticking off in this kind of area.
And then with the uh, shape of the, the ring, we also want to make sure that it is set into the volume and the perspective. So if the head is not being seen from the front, in this case the head is being seen at more of a three-quarter view, then that ring is going to be doing the same thing. And it needs to be turning so that it is not straight to us, but it's curved at that angle. So it's going to become more elliptical following that. Uh, I'm going to also suggest that we get rid of the spikes along the shoulder. It's just kind of an odd addition. Uh, it's not carried out through any of the rest. Uh, there's not really much else to justify that being part of his anatomy. So uh, I would say let's just drop that and then probably scoop the head over to be a little more centered and not so left heavy. Yeah. Okay, well that would be my feedback. Hopefully me stepping through that with you gives you a better idea of how to approach it. Uh, and then, you know, just double down, make sure that you're looking at some good references. Like this is a really good one. Look at some of the uh, places where those uh, wrinkles are, you know, being created and start adding in some of those. And uh, I, I think you'll be in a good place. Okay, wrapping up on that one. Next up, Joven. Hello, client. First time joining one of your challenges. Looking forward to your critique. Thanks. Joven, well, welcome. I'm glad you're able to get in, and hopefully we will make it worth your while. Okay, again, uh, a lot of various little uh, marks here just to walk through some different things. Uh, this is another one. I think you're in a really good position. Uh, it's less about correcting things than just honing in on the idea and getting more out of the image. Uh, the first thing I'm going to say is, you know, going forwards, uh, this particular image is pretty high key. So I'm going to suggest we we'll probably want to bring the darks back in a bit more. And might add in like a, a darkened layer, lower its opacity a little bit. And just bring some skin tone back in this guy. He's getting pretty washed out. And we want to be able to leave some room to do any kind of specular lights or that sort of thing. And we can't get too much brighter than where he was without him looking super chalky. Uh, this is also a place where you're probably going to see the eyes darker than what you think. Uh, people generally make uh, the eye, the white of the eye is lighter than it really should be because you think white, white of the eye. But the whole area there is in shadow, so you're likely to see this significantly darker than you think. And I can't really get it darker than that. It's probably going to set somewhere near this sort of value. And the eye color itself is probably going to be getting a bit darker. And the eye color, even if it's fairly bright color, it needs some direct light on it in order to help sell that color and to bring that color out. And if there isn't, then it's really going to just kind of get a bit darker. Uh, this is another situation where we could see having an overlay layer and bringing out some of the colors. This one uh, has excellent use of colors around the eye there. Look at those beautiful tones. This is a, it looks like, I don't know if this is a 3D model. I, I think it's a 3D model and not like a puppet sort of, you know, mannequin. Not sure though. Uh, really, really nicely designed. So here we could have, you know, a bit more of the reddish tone. Again, I don't need that 100%. Around here, we can even add a bit more warmth there in the eye. Here. Okay. 
And we do see that he has a decent amount of facial hair. So we're probably going to be getting more of your blue tones and cool tones, uh, as well as greens. Make sure that we probably got a little green in there, even if it's a bit more uh, subdued. And some of that is going to go down onto his neck as well. I'm going to make sure that's down there. Okay, let's talk about some of the forms going on that we want to pay attention to. Uh, one here is on the nose. It, the shape of this nose is just like the highest part of his nose is like way up there and there's kind of no division in between the planes. Uh, this guy is a good example of you can have kind of two different parts. This big part on the end. I'm going to get off the overlay there. This big part on the end and then you have the bridge of the nose. And we want to think about trying to add the division between those. Like we can have this sort of thing, and this guy's kind of overlapping here and here, and you have the nostrils coming off. But then we have the proper bridge in the nose there. That's big and wide, more like that guy. But it's kind of going to be a different shape than the end of the nose. And we're probably going to see a little angle change. You're likely going to pick up a bit more light right there along the top of this shape and then there will be kind of a I want to say a shadow but an angle change along that form and then it's going to run into the shapes you see over here which is the brow trying to bend around that big wide nose yep. And we're also going to see this skin trying to curve back up there. This is probably going to come down, curve out a little bit. And likely a spot here. The mouth is feeling a bit flat, so we want to make sure that we build up the shapes around the mouth so that we have some realistic volumes there. Again, another one where we kind of want to bring out the, the volume of the mouth barrel. Making sure that that's curving around. Uh, someone asked me recently, like, what is the most difficult feature of the face to draw? Uh, they thought I would say the eye. I really don't think the eye is the most difficult to do. I think the one that's most difficult to do well is probably the mouth. It has the most, uh, it has the most minute little volumes going on. There's so many angle changes of, you know, convex to concurve to bending. And every way it's bending like multiple ways. There's, there's multiple curves happening to every curve. Uh, where the eye itself is not that complex because it's basically a sphere and everything's mapped around the sphere. But in this one, you've got like the overall curve where it's going this way. And then you have the fact that it's curving up here. So you have a con uh, convex curve. And then you have a concave curve where it dips down in the philtrum back to a concave curve here. But of course, the whole thing can be warped by, you know, expression. So like this introduces a new uh, convex curve on this one side. And then the lip itself is a convex curve running into a concave curve while also being on a giant convex curve itself as it's mapped around the teeth. Uh, it, I mean, I can't imagine trying to do some of the 3D animating and matching mouth movements. Uh, it'd be ridiculous. Uh, I think that would be so hard to make it look right. Uh, some of the... Uh, little wrinkles here where it's coming down into the mouth, that would probably look nice. So here, and we also need to get the plane underneath the mouth. Uh, there has to be a decent amount of volume, usually the, the thickness of the teeth 
So we're going to have a plane underneath there before it runs into the volume of the chin. And the chin is probably going to have the core shadow along here. Uh, then it's going to round down. It's not just going to hit one spot and immediately get dark. It is a spherical shape. So it's going to gradually turn over. And there is going to be a bit more gradation. To that shape. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, you probably will just go back make sure you're looking at some references for ears. You can exaggerate some of the shapes, uh, but this looks like something that's almost been carved. It's like a super clean, perfect curve. Uh, we really want to be thinking about how the curves interact with each other and that it, the ear itself is a bit more wobbly than that. And it's got some more things going on with it than that. So uh, make a look you know, at some references there. Uh, anything else? Yeah, uh, let's uh, pull out a little, a little more uh, shapes down here with some of the skin kind of folding at the base of the neck. We don't need to spend a long time on it, but it looked a bit flat where it was, so let's make sure we don't forget about that, as well as some folds uh, being added to this, where it's having to bunch up around his neck. Uh, then it's going to come down here, and we're going to lose some of those folds as it lengthens out uh, to, to cover you know, his body. So we we'll want to add some of those there. That's the way that I would take it. Uh, hopefully you get something out of that moving forward, and I look forward to seeing what you do with it. Madao is up next. Okay, again, uh, no particular order. Uh, actually, let's start with uh, this point. And this brings up... Uh, I don't know, something that we as artists have to pay attention to when we're designing a character. And that is using conflicting kind of anatomy. So here we have several different references, really good references. Uh, I think that's one's from Max, uh, what's his name? Varian? Ma Maxim? Varian, I think. Uh, so really great uh, kind of striking, simple lighting. Uh, th that's what I was talking about. Like, if you want to do just a black and white, th that's fine. Um, because this is obviously a really good example of building a lot of form, conveying a lot of character, without necessarily needing to get into all the flesh tones and colors and stuff. So, if you want to do that, that's fine. Uh, but let's also make sure that we know what we're taking from this. So in this case, we have a very sallow-faced character, very, very thin. Uh, and like over here on this guy, we've got this very heavy guy, big, big jaw, wide-faced, muscular, uh, very muscular. Uh, same sort of thing over here with this guy, again, very sallow, thin. Uh, these guys, very heavy. Of course, the giant himself there. And it looks like you've kind of grabbed some from one and some from the other. And it has a dynamic where they're not really matching up well. It's like you have this big jowl here. So that you get the idea that the guy's fat. But then you have very sallow cheeks where the cheeks are pulling in. And that's not really something you're going to see. If somebody's fat enough to have a jowl that big under their chin, they're not going to have sallow cheeks. Um, so we need to figure out which is it. Is he is he thin or is he like really heavy set? And that alone should be able to help you make a lot of decisions going forwards with the character and answer a lot of those questions. 
So we see that in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, how do you want to do the chin? How do you want to do the jawline? That's going to be dependent on which direction you want to go with it. Uh, like we have this big fold up under his neck, but his head's tilted forwards. So if anything, if he tilts his head back, he might get a roll back there. But if you tilt your head forwards, you're stretching out the distance and you're not likely to have uh, a big fat roll when you move your head forwards. Uh, you would have to be pretty heavy, uh, pretty overweight in order for that to happen. So let's, let's think about what you want to do there. I'm going to assume, kind of going forwards with this review, that you want him to be heavier. There seems to be more people along that line. So even still, we can just have that as a thick neck. Uh, I can just kind of round it this way, have it here, big fat shoulder, run into the chest. Uh, and then if we do that, one of the biggest things we need to do is pay attention to this other side of the face because it is really sallow there. And what we want to do is make that a lot heavier and let that other side of the face be there. And then the mouth is dipping into it, but we still have that other side here. Um, this is a classic sort of um, planar uh, um, eyebrow. We are treating it as if you could see it from the side, it's almost triangular instead of rounding around like this. It's like it's just hitting one angle and it's immediately going from light to shadow. And that's just really not how eyebrows work. They're, they're not that hard of an angle. And we want to we want to even that out. So we need to come in here and we need to let that roll over. There needs to be a cylindrical form to that whole thing. And it's probably gonna highlight more there. And then might be, we're, we're looking at making this more gentle of a curve there. And this could be coming down like, like that. You can change the angle depending on what you want. Uh, this is another one where these little spikes really aren't justified by the anatomy. Um, so uh, I'm gonna suggest just taking them out. Uh, it's not a big enough part of the anatomy um, and nothing's built around them. They're not really continued. Um, I'll buy the fact that kind of like this uh, tribal fella here, he, he has some sort of way of ornamentation that he's put these things through his nose. Uh, and that's, that's fine. It's weird, but okay. I'll figure out that, you know, I reckon that he can figure out some way to do it. Uh, and same thing over here, though. Remember, this is, this is a cylinder, curved, S-curved cylinder, and it's not going to just have uh, a light edge and a heart, uh, a shadow edge. It's going to be there. Now, it can overlap the eye, and that's fine. But that's going to be a bit closer to a more natural form there. Okay, uh, what else? Oh yeah, the shapes of the eyes. We look at the shape like on this fella down here. The real big bag shapes under the eyes. Uh, very common for that sort of body type. Uh, yours seems a bit thin and it just kind of blends into the skin. Uh, he's got this brow here. You also find that when you do that, uh, it pushes the cheeks up and the brows down and it makes the eye more squinty. It's like he's not going to have an open eye down here while he's holding this expression. It's kind of be like his eye is going to be more, more pinched like that. And then that's going to have a bit of a, probably a round volume to it. 
and there can very likely be some more uh, kind of little ones running into that. Uh, don't forget about the amount of the chin. Uh, this is actually a mistake that I've made numerous times. Like, check out the size of the chin on that fella. I mean, that's a huge amount of chin. Well, that's a lot of face underneath the mouth right there. Uh, and here, basically, that's his chin. That right there. And there's... This is just, you know, extra. So, the chin really should be... At least that, right? And this can kind of be coming off here. And this, this barrel shape coming around there. Um, but more like that. Uh, just rendering wise, uh, when you move forwards, you might think about doing a little rebalance with the lighting that he's about the same skin tone as the background. I'm going to suggest you put the background uh, somewhere around this value if you're going to have that lighter skin tone so it sh shows up a bit more. His hair can be a bit darker than the background, and then the background can be uh, darker than the skin tone. Uh, maybe make it like extra dark back there towards the bottom so that you know, the skin can show up against that. Uh, we could even just let some of this go into shadow down here so that the face is a bit more lit. Uh, nothing complex there with the lighting. Uh, just letting the head show up a bit more and not be the same tone as the background. Okay, that's it for McDowell's. Thank you for joining in. Uh, you've been around, you've done a lot of these challenges, and apparently you're getting more out of them still. So thanks for coming back. Okay, next up is Robert Cornelius. He's doing the first uh, machine image so far. So I had some trouble with the gun. I repainted a ton of weapons before I landed on this one, but I'm still not totally confident with the perspective of it. Uh, also, I wanted to add a lot of machine stuff and gears, details between the plates, mainly by the elbows, so it doesn't look like just a dude in a suit. Uh, my intention is that there is only a few trees left in the world, and we have built these uh, mechs to use the power of the trees to protect us and preserve the trees within them. So that is a full grown tree inside, AKA he's huge. The tree definitely still needs work. Any tips on making it look like it's behind glass? Yeah, let's talk about a couple of the points there. And let's start with the one. Yeah, it definitely looks more like a, a guy in a suit. Now, I wouldn't think it's a human, it's a little unproportional to be human but I would think it was some sort of creature in uh, oh sorry yeah, let me move it over um, I would think that is some sort of creature in a suit and there's a couple of small changes uh, well a couple of changes you can make and that brings me to another point which is this is probably a bit too rendered for a concept because when I start talking about making changes, it's going to be you lost a significant amount of time because of how detailed you did a lot of this stuff. So going forwards, if you submit in a concept to someone, you probably don't want to put this much time into it and this much detail and, and refining it because when somebody else is going to be controlling you know, the direction of the image and not you, uh, you don't want to overinvest your time. So make sure that they know what they're looking at, but like all the filigree stuff, it's a lot of extra time. And so like here, uh, you have essentially what looks like a helmet. It doesn't look like a mechanized creature. It looks like a being in a suit, 
which is fine if it has four legs and it have that kind of anatomy, but don't give it a helmet face. You give it a face, it becomes organic, uh, which has a mask style face. Essentially, you gave it two slits for eyes and what we commonly recognize as being a breathing apparatus for a mouth. But this thing doesn't have eyes or mouth. In fact, it would seem more mechanical if you just took the head off of it. Just took the head off and it would feel more like a machine because we wouldn't insinuate that this is a humanoid. Now it feels more like some sort of machine, right? Now I feel like this is the main thing, like this is what it's all about. I'm not confusing it with the head. There's no combat about what this is. Uh, I don't know what that's running to, so we probably don't, that's a little distracting. So we'll just simplify that. So we take that out. Um, the, I think ultimately, that feels like a better solution. Okay, going forwards, yes, we need more of the gears uh, and that sort of feeling to the different joints. We don't really have that. So let's look at moving away from the glowing spheres. I think it's fine that this thing has like a glowing effect to it, but we uh let's get rid of the ones on here and we can just have some like big metal gears that go around and you know this piece is running into that piece and this has like a multi-part gear right there and maybe you show you know, some of the little i forgot what they're called little teeth in the gear and that would immediately help us know that it's mechanical you could also add things like uh, you know, adding kind of like a hole here adding some sort of piston thing that comes down from the chest piece you know down to the uh, to the arm so the it's got more of uh, that sort of thing going on with it, and you could have you know the pieces kind of connecting up that way. And and I just marked that like we need gears here on the major joints. So you might want to move out uh, some of this. We we stop short on some of these armor pieces take out some of these armor pieces so that we can have a little piston coming out from this spot down here uh, then we can have a gear here and something running into that gear there uh, then a counter little piston coming up behind that one so there's one on this side there's one on the back side uh, then this armor piece just kind of covers up a bit of that but it doesn't cover up all of it, so we can see that going on in there. All right, cool. Uh, I'm in basically taking that in multiple places. Like instead of having this one big curved piece there, like we turn that into again like a strut, and then maybe we see through part of that and. And we have like another strut coming down there. Um, okay, let's talk about the tree. Uh, the tree is good. Um, it's kind of an interesting idea, but there's probably a more effective way to do it. Uh, I certainly did not get the impression that this thing was a full-size tree and that it was housing a full-size tree. So we might want to show a more normal tree situation going on. And what I'm thinking is, uh, oh yeah, I found some of these. Uh, these were some images I had of painting glass and people that have painted 
glass sort of effectively. Uh, that was a Google image of just a glass ball. I don't know why it doesn't want me to be able to, oh, I, that's not what I'm clicking. So uh, kind of taking some cues from those, what we want to do is work out what the whole thing is doing. And we want to paint it normal. I'm going to suggest painting it normal to begin with as if there was no glass, uh, then we will layer the glass on top of it. So I will paint out most of it. I just want to still see some of the volume there. Uh, then think about this maybe being a, almost like a little planet, uh, planetarium, uh, an arboretum. What do you call it? It's like, it has plants in it. Maybe it has like a whole like little grass scape in there. Terrarium. That's kind of what it was. It's like a terrarium, but the size for uh, an entire proper tree. So we've got like a terrarium thing going on there. And then We've got Mr. Tree inside of that. And I'm, I'll do a super, super lame little tree here just to throw it in. And then we have, you know, top of the tree, something like here. And maybe we have a couple of different plants. I don't, I don't know. We could, have, we could have some little flowers in there too. Mm -hmm. I'm yellow flowers. Right. Uh, then my thought would be, let's add a little uh, piece on the top that's essentially the illuminator, that it's kind of the sunlight. So on the top, it would be dark because there's no light getting up on top of it, but it perhaps has little uh, pieces, you know, running up to it up to down to the other side about the same spot on the other side now you would see it lit through the glass on that other side so it'd be lit there and you might be able to see just a little bit of light kind of here and then mr tree could have uh, he's kind of lit from the top right so he's kind of got this thing going on where the lights coming down on him uh, then we could work on having a little glass effect where the side would be a little mirroring. You kind of have a little of kind of the distortion of some of these colors as it comes up. And it's going to distort some of the stuff around here. How many people do I have in here right now? 41. Okay, cool. Thank you again, everyone, for uh, hanging out and uh, joining the stream. Uh, let's see, we do have a light source over here on this side, so it's probably going to pick up some light from that one. Uh, we might have another light source over here if you add it, so we could have like another kind of highlight going there. Uh, we are going to still have some more distortion as it works here, we could just do a normal smudge. That wouldn't be far from what would be going on there. Yeah, usually uh, having the other light sources in the scene helps you map uh, the the highlights and, and bring out the forms, but we don't have too much of that on this, so we'll have to play around. But um, this is probably going to reflect some of the light uh, up at the top in a little bit.
anyway, uh, that might get you a bit closer um, to the direction that you were thinking. So hopefully that gives you some ideas. Uh, I, I don't think the perspective is really problematic. Uh, I think it's okay. Um, I, I think the gun is fine. I would take it as some sort of defensive thing, even if I don't completely understand what it is. And uh, make sure that we're getting in, in the gears. If you do want to use more of a head shape, then let's get rid of the eye slits. Let's get rid of the, the breathing apparatus sort of shapes and make it very, um, very machine-like. Like, go look at an in, uh, engine and use a head shaped on, like, a car engine and those sorts of shapes, uh, very mechanical-based. Make sure that we're removing enough of the armor around the joints, uh, which, of course, wouldn't make sense. You would want to armor the joints, but we need to convey that this is a machine. So, okay, that'll wrap it up here. Don't say... Next up, Thea. It was hard for me to design this medieval robot, so I based mine on the metals, materials, and shapes from the Middle Ages. Uh, although I tried to, although I tried to let inspiration from modern robots and mechs, I'm wondering what more complex shapes I could have used. Uh, I think being inspired by medieval kind of shapes um, and metals, uh, that's fine. But we also, uh, on the right line with you thinking, maybe not the best shapes. So the materials is good, but the shapes are kind of off. Uh, this is one I'm going to suggest uh, you also ditch worrying about colors, ditch worrying about trying to create some fancy lighting, Let's just go to black and white. Uh, we want to focus on the design of this thing, working out the volumes of the forms, and not trying to complete some really fancy full color illustration. Because uh, we've got some odd things going on, the perspective and the overall design. So let's talk through some of those. Okay, let's go to the green layer. I'm going to make this layer different colors so it shows up more. There. So on this guy, uh, one of the first things that we're seeing is this really uh, kind of odd perspective for this particular machine where we're straight on at it, but we're sort of looking down on it, and we have this really... Um, really distorted view it's uh like we had a a small um i'm trying to think you're trying to uh, a wide angle lens right and you get close to something and it really distorts the uh, perspective and foreshortening so it's like it's really wide here and very narrow there it's like halved the overall distance within just the you know distance of the the machine uh, we have all these things like coming right at us and it's just not working too well. So I'm going to challenge you. Let's, I, I, this perspective is not helping you. Okay, so let's try to move it to a different perspective. Just back, back it up. And this is more just, this is less art director kind of talking and more art teacher talking to you. You specifically, it would be better for you. Let's go back to black and white. Uh, you can use a lot of the elements of this, but let's find a more normal perspective that uses like, you know, the thing is kind of in this view, a three-quarter view, so we can very easily understand what all the shapes are. And this, you know, thing is coming up here, and it's got like its body here. And this would be a lot easier to uh, understand the what's coming, you know, out of the machine. Because a lot of this stuff is like trying to point straight at us and it's kind of flattening out. Okay, uh, going forwards. We've got the uh, thing going on here and some of it has to do with the perspective where it's like, it's very small where it attaches and it gets really big on the ends. 
and that can be okay in the right way like on these guys the ends are really big but it's not like the size of the arm itself is big but the ends of it has a, a metal guard covering uh you know its leg area and the same thing down here i buy the fact that this leg is thick enough to actually hold up that leg uh, and then it has, of course, the armor plates there at the end. So that's not really what we have here. We have this really thin arm and just really big ends on it. So let's try to not unbalance that too much. And if you do want to make it bigger, let's add another shape like they have on those that is an armor piece that goes over it and still the main, uh, the main thing goes underneath it. Uh, Additionally, uh, this would be a really good challenge for you. Uh, let's move away from focusing on the rendering of the piece. Uh, we're not going to be looking at this stuff. We're, let's not worry about speckling rust, all right? Doing that. Uh, we don't need to do that kind of thing. We don't need to worry be worrying about painting every chain link and every little, uh, you know, screw head. What we want to do with this one for you is focus on learning mechanical joints, learning how simple machineries work, uh, understanding how gears work, uh, you know, joints like this, and how you have to have like a piston to push it. How does this piece, you know, coming this way meet up into the gear? How does the other piece come off of it? What happens here? So go look at some tutorials for that. Think about, you know, if you have a, a cylinder, uh, essentially like a shaft, uh, then you've got another piece coming down that's meeting onto that. Then this piece could come down here like that. Uh, then those could connect and we get the idea that this could turn around inside of the other one, right? And then you can maybe add another piece that connects onto this one. So study some of these. Uh, I haven't looked, but I would assume there are some, oh, actually, I do know of some. Uh, go look up the Etherington brothers. And they have uh, a bunch of simple tutorials called How to Think When You Draw. Uh, Etherington brothers, E T H E R. I-N-G-T-O-N, how to think when, uh, when you draw. And I think it has like machines, robots, something on that line. And they show different simple mechanical joints and go learn those and then come back. And that ought to make a huge difference in uh, the overall machine quality. Uh, right here, it, it looks like you're just adding in random little shapes, hoping that it makes it look more mechanical. But like these things, they don't make any sense. They, they just don't make any sense. They're just a shape. Um, we've got like a bunch of wires, but this thing doesn't look like it's really ran on wires. So go back and, and we want to practice more on that. Uh, I agree with you, the shapes, uh, what more interesting shapes could you do? There are certainly a lot more interesting shapes you could do. Uh, this is uh, kind of just a basic round, almost crab shape. But look at some of these, right? Try to break it down into more points. And how do these pieces connect? Are there multiple joints to them? Uh, could this be like a little engine? Could there be a grate? In here with some fires coming up let's get rid of the actual head it's not a person that doesn't really need a head it's an automaton let's take a look at the examples like no particular head only what we could vaguely call a head uh, which is just a glowing kind of hole right there this is head like again it's just a glowing grate uh, that has a driver don't worry about that Again, no head. We don't necessarily need a head on these things. They can just have a big armor plate right there with some sort of design on it, and that's fine. Or it can just have a glowing grate, and that's fine. Or it has nothing at all, and that's fine. Again, it doesn't need to look humanoid. Um, the metal thing here, 
uh, I mean, the glowing thing here, I assume this is some sort of magical power device. Uh, if you want to do that, let's push it a bit further and maybe have like something that connects into it that makes it look like it maybe it's drawing energy out of it. It also looks like a really important and fragile piece. So while we want to see some of it, maybe it has like some protective rings that go around it, just something that makes it feel like it's protected. Uh, and also it feels super top heavy. Like it's got this little bitty attachment and literally all of this is being balanced and held by this piece of metal right here. I assume the glass is a container. It's not really supporting much. So this piece of metal is having to hold up everything. And I, it's just not real believable. So we could think about doing something different like if there's struts that come up to this and maybe there's a ring that comes around that uh, then in between those struts or other struts that go up to this thing uh, T-1000 right? Uh, yeah, but from Terminator take a look at the way that they do the body on that guy right? look at the metal uh, uh, endoskeleton of the T-1000 and see how you know, some of the mechanical stuff going on in those. All right, well, I, I know I threw a lot at you. I just wanted to give you uh, uh, plenty of direction to, you know, where to go, maybe some things to focus on. So that'll be it for that piece. And Thomas Medina is up next, next to last here. Uh, T-800. Go yeah, see. T-800 is the... Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, T-800, because he's the one played by Arnold Schwarzenegger. T-1000 was the uh, the shapeshifter. Not the, I'm, I'm not talking about the shapeshifter. And then it was the the TX. Okay, that's what I was getting confused with, because the TX was what, Terminator 3? Okay. Uh, some of the same things. Uh, actually, quite a few of the same things from the other one. Uh, so I do like that you made a little model here, uh, kind of getting an idea of the volume. But I feel like perhaps that you got a little too influenced by some things that were too far away from what you needed. Because uh, like this Colossus guy has so little to do with it. I'm not sure why he's in there because it's not supposed to be made of stone. It's supposed to be made of metal. Uh, this is some interesting ideas, but again, like that's kind of working on a totally different scale. Um, so and th that's why I did put this here because we want to make sure that we're sticking uh, towards the uh, the brief. So I, I did these little lines here and I just wanted to show we're, we're losing our sense of volume and placement of everything. That We've got the idea of the volume. I have a fairly good feeling of the volume of the, the body itself, if we could just put that in basic cube you know, terms. Cuboid, I guess, it's on an actual cube. And that would tell me this leg's not touching the ground. It would tell me that leg's not touching the ground. It says maybe that one is touching the ground. So it feels like it's sitting on its belly and it just kind of has its legs up in the air. And that's why I'm gonna suggest, okay, this can serve as the general direction for the image, but let's restart it by working it from the ground up and figuring out the, the space that it's working in. Uh, I'll step through it. So first thing we wanna do is work out where is it sitting and how much volume is it taking up? So we can figure out, like, this one will be a little bit different than, than what I just drew. So it'll be, you know, whatever perspective you want, something like that. I don't know why I'm making it lean. That's not real helpful. Okay, uh, then we can say, all right, well, what I want is the body to be taking up about that much 
space, but I want it off the ground about that far, so I can just move it up from that location a bit. And then I know where it's sitting in the three-dimensional volume. And if you ever watch videos by like, um, what's it, Kim Jong He, uh, he explains things in this way too. And then I know that if I have a joint here, here, and here, then the most likely points that those need to touch are right there. So I know that that's going to be the right distance from each corner. So I can have the legs coming up. But with the leg designs, let's take a look at these. Like You'll notice that to have a good mobility for a leg like this, you're going to have the joint here. And then it's going to have that V. And then it's going to come down. And it's going to have one last little toe joint right there. And again, that one starts on the other side, so it has that V, and then it comes down in the last little joint. Uh, yours just has the boom, boom, and the toe. Uh, and that's not going to be nearly as mobile, and it, it's not as interesting either. So let's think about doing what we have on these. So bump, bump, back down. So this can come here, and then up, and kind of come back like this. Same thing, but this leg is going to really start overlapping the rest of it, but that's fine. That's how foreshortening works. Overlapping, joint, joint, curving back. Uh, you could map those across so that they're the right size all the way each one. And that would be going back behind the other thing. Uh, we also want to pay attention to the joints itself. Uh, same sort of thing I tell, told the uh, last image, which is this is a great place to so stick with black and white. Don't worry about the colors. Don't worry about a lot of uh, detailing, adding in, you know, all this little stuff that you see on these. Don't worry about adding in all the little marks and gear heads and screws and that sort of thing. Uh, for here, uh, this is a great place just to learn again about machinery, about joints. Um, how do pieces of machinery fit to each other? Let's pay attention to how the legs are joining into the bodies of these things. Uh, so we want to look to see what is the shape of this body. We're probably going to have like a metal piece here. Uh, then we want to have a joint in there. And the joint is likely going to have some sort of round gear there because that's the way it curves and around there. But uh, we're, we're doing it that way, I guess, now. be like that. Uh, maybe it has that metal guard here. Usually they put uh, guards around the joints, maybe it even has like an under guard to that joint and then an over guard to this joint, like the fender on your car, right? And it kind of circles around that. And then it has to connect somehow. Uh, maybe it has little pistons between those joints. And then it has joint right there look maybe like a little axle thing going through that I don't know why it would have an axle in there it's more like a drive shaft or whatever uh, I'm not real mechanically inclined I can draw it well enough to kind of fake my way through it though um, so that's good uh, same thing with this it's like a super simple shape but it looks like you're running with basically a kind of a furnace I don't know what this is but I'm going to suggest go look at some old furnaces, like steampunk furnace, and figure out some cool shape to have a grate here, uh, just some glowing coming out of it. And same sort of thing you have like this. This would be a great inspiration for what to do with that. You could just have some big curved metal you know, front piece there with your, your runes on it, and then it probably might... Uh, have some like side pieces here that could do you know this sort of thing. And you start making a variety of these different shapes, uh, kind of fitting around each other, and like that. And then you would have room for that joint there, and maybe it has like a back piece. Maybe it has you know like pipes sticking out of it, and like smoke coming out of it. Maybe it has a hatch here that can be opened up. There's a little window. You can see the fire. Maybe it has a little handle that somebody could open up and put more coal into it or something. Uh, so start thinking out some of that. 
Uh, this is another one where something coming straight at you really works very well. So it would just be better if that arm was coming out uh, and then was like just kind of coming down in front of it. Uh, same sort of thing there. You can just do, you know, that sort of thing. Almost like a praying mantis. You know, that sort of feeling there. Uh, if you want to, uh, we can put some wires on it, but kind of getting the ideas from these, it's not like little computer wires. It's more like these sort of heavier cables uh, that are probably not pushing electricity, but likely pushing fluid, uh, like hydraulic fluid or that sort of thing. So you can have like a cable kind of dangling off of that. Maybe there's another cable sort of wrapping around that guy. Um, maybe there's a cable there. So like that direction. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there. And uh, th this ought to be a really good one for you. If you let yourself dive into this, find some more resources, find some little tutorials on drawing uh, machines, robots, bring in uh, your knowledge of the joints and spend a little time drawing them. Draw the different kinds of joints that there are in machinery and get to where you understand the basics of how they work. Uh, then once you understand that, when you start drawing something like this, you won't just be drawing the two dimensional shapes and throwing together an idea, you'll actually be designing the robot and you would be designing the machinery. And, and that's really cool when you know enough of it that you can do that. Uh, David, hello to you. Let's see. Okay. Uh, last up is Tyler Vell. Well, let's take a look at that one. Uh, Tyler's just working in grayscale by choice. Cool, fine with me. Uh, forms and drawing, thank you for your feedback. Uh, so, Tyler, this is another one. No big mistakes. Uh, good place for the concept at this point. And from here, we just want to refine the overall uh, design of it and get a bit more believability into the organic shapes, a little more subtlety into some of the shapes. So let's go through some of the major ones that should be helpful. Uh, what is not an organic shape? I just, I'm not sure what this is. Maybe you know what it is and you're going to fill it out later. Uh, currently at this point, I'm not real sure. Is it another shield? Because I, I get the idea that he's made some sort of band, you know, with, with people that he's smooshed. And, and I, this is a classic shield shape. So I get that. That's fine. Um, well, on these, uh, let's think about, you know, going forward, put some sort of shield design. Like a lot of these uh, shields probably have like some sort of, uh, you know, it look like a, a wheel hub. Uh, I don't know what their name is. The metal piece that goes in the middle of the, the big round shields and a lot of the square ones. Uh, you know, putting that there or if it's going to have a nice big, uh, you know, design on it, you know, some dragon or whatever, uh, just some faded paint on there like that, and that would help sell it. And also think that can be carried down here. Uh, I find it a little unusual that he's just big, you know, menacing giant. Oh, I've got my little headband. And a li little odd. I don't know that it's really helping the character. Uh, if you're going to do that, I'm going to, I probably treat him a bit more like a, a hoarder that he just collects all this stuff. So he might have like this big heavy kind of cloak and he's got all of this stuff just affixed to it. So it's not just this random head thing that he's got. Uh, maybe he's even got like ropes hanging down. You know, he's got like stuff hanging off these ropes or there's more necklaces with, with stuff hanging off of it. Um, anyway, kind of that direction of thought. Uh, Design-wise for the face, uh, similar thing here with the eyes. I, I think you're in a pretty pretty good place here, right? and probably because you were looking at this. Um, let's play up this shape here. That initial shape right there. Uh, and we're going to make that probably even extra rounded. 
And because he's so much heavier than you are, it's likely going to have another one there. And then this essentially is going to become a big baggy one right there too. So we can make that a nice bigger shape there too. And that's going to round down. Uh, this is a nice form where it's overlapping there. Uh, I, I think we want to push his eyebrow more if he has an eye, much of an eyebrow. Somewhere like that. And let's find some more interesting shapes to push his nose. Right now it's just kind of like a big sphere. But we want to find some more interesting planes in this and curves. Uh, like this guy over here is a really good example of... Look at these. It's not just one big curve, right? It's not just a sphere. It's got really nice aggression to these angles. So you can see it is kind of like a cylinder here, and then a little sphere there, and then it pulls back there. And that's the sort of thing I think you can go with yours. Uh, it doesn't need to be necessarily that same shape, but like this staying the same size all the way across. Okay, a little boring, but if it was like wide here and then narrower on that side, so it has a little, a little change to it. Okay, cool. Uh, then like on your nose, I assume this is self-portrait, I'm just guessing, that it pulls back up, the skin does, there. And so we could look at doing the same sort of thing, that skin kind of folds back there that way. And then you have the main nostril here. And there could even be like some folds coming out from that. And then we want to see maybe even some folds along the top like we have on that one. Where this plane, we have a bit of a plane here. Kind of that same cylinder shape. We have a bit of a plane there. And then we might even have a couple little wrinkles here. And then this shape. back over there. Uh, you're doing good establishing some of those. This one. Uh, let's also look at the uh, the mouth. It's looking pretty good. Uh, but what we want to pay attention to is like we have the round part of the the mouth itself with the lips kind of curve out. But then you have the cheek on the back side. And we've got actually two different forms going on where like this is kind of curving out, and then we're probably going to have this fold on the opposite side kind of coming there. And then we're going to have that curving into the, uh, the shape of the chin. So then the chin is going to be here. And even on yours, this lighting doesn't show it much, but we've got that angle change here and that barrel shape there. And that's not where this is flattening out a bit too much when we should have still a bit of that barrel coming around. So let's see about kind of playing up that flow. And that would curve back on itself there. And with the mouth, there's a couple of shapes. It's going to have kind of that shape there. So if you want to think about it, it's kind of like this. And then basically there's kind of two forms here. It usually has a flattened or slightly up curve to the bottom. Oops, reverse that. Uh, then this is going to have a slight V shape. It's going to have a small center line there. If you want to think about the center line, be a bit like that. And uh, then mapping that onto a three dimensional form can be a little hard, but I think some big full lips on him would work pretty well. And uh, then letting that fold down. And uh, then that's where it would come down into the chin. So that could come down here. And that's where we're going to get that curve. And this one, uh, right now it's just like one basic curve. 
but we're probably going to get it having a couple of little curves as it's going around the different volumes. Um, this is a really nice shape along that cheekbone if we want to bring out that cheekbone just a little bit more. Uh, his ear is really seems maybe a bit big. Uh, I, I would probably size his ear down just a bit and maybe push it back so that we can have some more uh, cheekbone action. Go on there and there, get a little shadow coming in. Get that from here. Oh yeah, we might get a, a little more of the, uh, not like big thick eyebrows, but a couple of long hairs kind of sticking up there. Yeah, that sort of thing. Uh, we also, probably a uh, nice big Adam's apple. We want to think about the volumes of the neck that you basically have uh, kind of a cylinder barrel shape as it curves down there and it's held either side by you know the main muscles tendon oh i'm not even sure uh, the neck uh right now the shoulder is just kind of running ambiguously up into the head area where we really could have a bit more of a neck volume, uh, which is the, it's kind of kind of round in here. Uh, then the trapezius can meet up nice and high. You know, something like that. Uh, that collarbone could be, you know, down here somewhere. Uh, uh, Lighting-wise, uh, similar to what we saw on the other one, uh, I'm just thinking that he either needs to be uh, a bit lighter than the background or a bit darker than the background, as notated by my note there. So, you know, if he was going to be uh, a little darker skin tone, that's not the brush. That would just make it all the same. Could, we, we could drop him to having slightly darker skin tone, and then if you do that, we probably brighten it up, maybe not white. That would seem a bit stark, but uh, something more on that line. And probably some just basic lighting, not unlike what you see here. That, that's a nice lighting actually in both of these, where it essentially gets shadowed on the edge. And if you wanted to add a nice bright light, then you could do that. Uh, and that would be the advantage of not having a white background is that if you did want to come add a side light to this, you'd have the room in the value scheme to add such a light and it would actually stand out. Uh, if you wanted to, you could drop the background value just a little bit so that light stands out and you know, it would get some of that hair and stuff back there. Yeah, the, the general down lighting that you've got here is working pretty well. Uh, something else I've got to mention, um, and, and it goes for this one and, and for the others. Uh, drawing, draw, drawing wrinkles can be not the best way to do it. You know, doing it in reverse can actually be better sometimes. And you see this actually quite a bit in a traditional painting, where essentially you would paint that area darker, something like that. Uh, then you come in with the lighter tone and you draw in, you sort of draw in the, instead of drawing in the dark wrinkles, you're drawing in the lit areas. So I'm kind of drawing in the forms that I want. And that way, you're not drawing all the lines in between them. You're just drawing in the, like that. And so by drawing in the light stuff, you can add in a lot of detail really quick. Uh, and it gives the illusion that you spent a lot of time drawing all these little finessed forms when you just really didn't do it at all. What you did is just, painted in the, the little light stuff. 
who who was it that submitted the the image? Um, no. Uh, this guy does it quite a lot. If you go look at his stuff, using the uh, drawing with the light uh, to create shadows. Uh, he probably does it over here on this one too. And so you actually start kind of drawing in, you know, like, like this. Something like that. It's like that could be a fold. So I'm actually going to draw in the light on the inside of that. And I just kind of come in here and I start picking out that different little places where there could be little wrinkles. How to paint it with the light color. I went for years without ever using this approach and I'll tell you what, it can be way faster. So that's just like, you know, throwing together a lot of that little detail. Uh, same sort of thing down here, you know, if you uh, shaded the mouth and then you wanted to come back and add Lots of little, and and what you're doing is actually letting some of the randomness and the strokes actually help tell you the little volumes of what's going on. And generally, you want one side to be slightly harder than the other side. Like this side, I'm going to let be hard and has more contrast there, and then I'm going to let it fuzz out a bit on the other side. Again, this side is going to have contrast. Uh, then I'm going to let this side on the right side fuzz out a little bit. And then I can come in here and I can get inside of the inside bits. Brighten them up just a little bit. Yeah, I meant to cover that earlier in the uh, the stream, but I'm glad I remembered because it was one of those points that just applied to a bunch of people and I, I wanted to talk about. And, and this is a lot easier to do if you're working in black and white and you don't have to worry about um, color variation or shifting from you know, uh, one, one hue to another hue or vibrancy or anything like that and you're just working with the, uh, the values. This, I don't really like proper detailing, but this, frankly, is kind of fun. This I could do for a while and just <laughs> almost veg out. Uh, also a good place if you do not have a proper little smudge brush set up. And you can come in here. Like I said, uh, one side you generally want to be a bit more contrasty, like left side, right side. That's kind of what I'm talking about. And soften out some of those. So that's a, a lot of, uh, you know, detail kind of put in very quickly. And that's also how you can get some interesting skin textures and stuff. Uh, you can go overboard by just putting that sort of detail everywhere, uh, and you don't really need it. There are some forms, like you know, the the cheek here, where you're not going to have much. I mean, it's it's pretty much stretched over the bone, 
So you're not going to have like a bunch of rinsey that even on this one, he's got all these like little age spots, um, dirt spots, that sort of thing. And you can add that in there, just different little spots if you want to change up the shape of them, different kind of little tones. That also makes the skin feel a bit more realistic, kind of going back to somebody else asked earlier, how do you do skin tones? Part of skin tones is the amount of variation. Uh, don't feel bad about adding in some little imperfections, like maybe he's got, you know, little little moles or something on his on his face. Um, he, he's probably not the sort of person that goes to the skin doctor to get those looked at, so he can have you know, that little thing on there. But, okay, uh, that should wrap it up for this one. Uh, Tyler, thanks for joining in uh, the challenge, and uh, hopefully the rest of you found all of these reviews helpful. Uh, just taking a look, I'm not seeing any more questions. I don't know if anybody's not asking them or sometimes chat just uh, stops loading. I'll give just a moment in case uh, somebody wants to throw a last question at me. But let me close this down. Don't say it. So uh, going forwards uh, in two weeks, um, if I'm not in the middle of moving, then we will look at the finals of this. And then the following day, uh, we should be kicking off the next art challenge, which I don't know what it is at this point. I'll be putting together ideas when it gets closer. But as usual, if you guys want to continue posting your stuff out on the Swatches Facebook group, uh, just go to swatches.group if you're not joined out there. And you can welcome to put it out there, let the other guys look at it, give you some feedback over the next two weeks uh, before you send it in for the final. And uh, I tell you what, I, I want to say thank you for you guys that do get feedback out there. A lot of you put real thought into it. And it's not a let me prove that I know more than you do sort of thing. You, you really do have a good attitude to it. Uh, if you find somebody that is... Uh, that has a bad add to it and, and is just not constructive in their criticism, let me know and I'll try to address it. Uh, but so far, I, I don't see that very much. And I want to thank you for doing that. Uh, Thomas says, uh, I will try. I will. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, super insightful. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for joining in. Uh, this is more of a mindset question than an art question, but I have an apprehension when taking on challenges, not out of fear, but the feeling of depriving someone else of the opportunity. Don't worry about it, Michael. Uh, you do what you need to do to move forwards. Uh, there, there is a lot of opportunity out here. And you know, if you want to join in the challenge and get a ticket, then that, that's for you, right? If they somebody else does not get a ticket, it's not like they can't learn. There's thousands of other opportunities. Okay, and I offer consultations, I offer, you know, Patreon, just myself, I offer other things if people want to get feedback from me. But you need to do what you need to do for your art moving forwards. Uh, as long as you're not being underhanded about it, you take use of the opportunities that you get. And if you think this is something that would be good for you, you know, then get in on something like that. Uh, you have to remember that there's probably not as much jockeying for for opportunities that, that you think. It's like work. It's, it's like saying, I don't want to become a professional artist because there's already so many good people. It's like, yeah, but you know what? Not everybody's trying to do the same thing. And not everybody who's even interested in doing the same thing has the same schedule. So this might be a really good you know, time for you to take on this new challenge. But even though somebody else might want to do it, maybe it's a week they can't do it. So you should. Anyway, uh, just a little comment on that. Uh, next week is, is probably a good chance I won't stream because if things work out the way that I think, uh, I might be moving next week. So I, I will let you know. I'll just keep you up to date on that. But. I'm going to wrap it up there for the stream. Uh, thanks again for joining me, and 
Uh, oh, uh, quick note for the patrons. Uh, I am working on materials chapter two, and it will probably be several weeks before it gets out. I have an outline of what I want to cover, but it has a lot of illustrations that need to be done. So those will take a while, and I will try to, I'll try to move through those as quickly as I can. Uh, but cu a couple of things on the plate, namely housing. Uh, I, I've got to make that a priority, and <laughs> I do not want to come down to the wire and not have any time left to try to find somewhere. So anyway, thanks again. I will catch you guys later. Until then, keep drawing.